Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We will now proceed to panel one titled The Partition of British India, August 1947. The distinguished panelists for the session are Ian Talbot, Professor of Modern British History, University of Southampton, United Kingdom. Aisha Jalal, Mary Richardson, Professor of History, Tufts University, United States. And chairing this session is Dr. Yanish Kudesia, Associate Professor of South Asian Studies, NUS. I will now hand the floor to Dr. Kudesia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ganesh Kudesia. I teach in the South Asian Studies program at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences in this university. Thank you for your attendance this morning. This is a very interesting panel on the partition of British India, and we have two very distinguished uh, scholars in this, Professor Ian Talbot and Professor Aisha Dilla. Both of them work on have worked in the last 20, 25 years, 30 years, on two very central figures, uh, Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India, and Kaidi Adam Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Both are enigmatic figures, and in some ways, much of the narrative about partition hinges upon how we understand these two figures. So this is a very promising panel in that respect. Without further ado, let me uh, introduce Professor Talbot to you is based at the University of Southampton, which is where the Mountbatten Archives is located. And he has been mining that archives for very not, for very, very many years. He has written extensively on partition of India and on the history of modern Pakistan. His most recent works is Colonial Lahore, co-authored with Tahir Kamran, A History of the City and Beyond published in, 1920. in 2016. He has also published recently History of Modern South Asia, Politics, States and Diasporas, uh, published by Yale University Press. His History of Pakistan, uh, published about 20 years ago, which he has been updating regularly, is uh, of course uh, very well established. And of course the Partition of India, published by Cambridge in 2009. Uh, may I request him to make his presentation? Okay, firstly I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to, to come. I've, I've visited uh, Singapore before, National University, but not uh, a joint event like this, which is a, a, a new development as we've heard already today. And what I wanted to really do was to use this as an opportunity to go back and look at some of the um, Mountbatten papers, which uh, Gyanish has already mentioned there at Southampton, and to see um, what we can glean from those in terms of um, British intentions regarding the partition uh, of India uh, in 1947. Uh, and as he's already hinted, uh, the whole role of Mountbatten uh, is incredibly controversial uh, as far as this is concerned, uh, in terms of uh, whether it was his personal policy, whether he basically messed it up uh, because of his uh, desire to uh, leave India uh, as soon as he could, uh, and not to take a measured approach uh, to partition. There's also all the controversies about whether he favoured uh, India over Pakistan in terms of the boundary awards, uh, whether his personal relationship with Nehru uh, certainly led to um, the squeezing out of Jinnah in this process, which has already been referred to. Uh, or, or whether, as I'm going to try and argue, in many respects, uh, Mountbatten created this mythology that he had far more influence in terms of uh, the partition than was reality. He was reacting to events, both on the ground and in terms of 
a grand British strategy uh, relating to um, what they wanted to try and achieve. And indeed, in some senses, partition could be seen as a reluctant move, not something that uh, certainly Van Patten uh, was even determined on when he arrived uh, in India, uh, but something that was reluctantly agreed upon by the British in, in order to try and serve wider strategic interest ultimately. Although initially, uh, partition was actually not a popular policy as far as um, the India office was concerned uh, and, and British officialdom because of the fact that it might actually undermine uh, some of Britain's interests uh, in uh, maintaining particularly a military influence. We've already heard reference to the fact that um, obviously the uh, Indian Army was a crucial element uh, in British imperial power. So the fear of what the division uh, of the Indian Army uh, might do in terms of British strategic interest uh, was one factor uh, in uh, influencing uh, opinion. So those people who um, sort of try and read back uh, the idea that um, Pakistan was deliberately created uh, as a kind of military bastion uh, for uh, British interest. I think uh, if you look at the actual records of the time, uh, it's the opposite and there's the fear uh, that uh, partition and the division of the army will undermine uh, British strategic interests. And what we've got to bear in mind is that Britain, uh, when it was handing over power uh, to uh, the Indian subcontinent, um, was still uh, an avowed imperial power. Uh, the independence of India was not seen, uh, though with hindsight it's often viewed as the beginning of the end of the British Empire, that wasn't necessarily the way it was viewed by contemporaries. So a means of trying to maintain uh, British influence as an imperial power uh, was a crucial factor, I think, in thinking about uh, future strategic developments. Um, obviously, after Pakistan is created, uh, and certainly in the context of the emerging Cold War, and also in the context uh, of fears of uh, Pakistan's weakness and possible collapse uh, after the emergence of the Kashmir uh, dispute, uh, leads to British strategic thinking, and of course also the United States, which becomes drawn into the region because of the Kashmir conflict and because of um, its Cold War perspective leads to the notion of Pakistan as a military bastion and of course this is reflected in the 1954 um, military agreement uh, which is signed between uh, Pakistan and the United States. But to read back from 1954 to 1947 and what the intentions are uh, I think really is, is mistaken though obviously um, Narendra Singh Sarilla in the shadow of the great game uh, and obviously Gurinder Chadha's film which um, quite a controversial film which came out of Iceroy's house uh, last year you know uh, very much look at uh, this notion of, of a kind of almost conspiracy to create uh, Pakistan as a military bastion but that doesn't really uh, stand up to an analysis uh, of, of the record Partition and British End of Empire, uh, we've already heard in the, the lecture how uh, partition was certainly um, a factor in a number of British decolonizations. And yet, uh, again, I think if you look broadly uh, at uh, British decolonization, often it's federation, uh, which is the preferred option coming out of decolonization, not partition as such, and partition is more, uh, I, I think, related to particular circumstances, usually as we've again heard uh, already in terms of uh, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, as, as a means to solve a problem, not necessarily a preferred option, which is for bigger units, and the reason for that is because bigger units will be stronger, uh, and again, I think this is 
something which is influenced uh, within the Cold War uh, context. This links in with strategic thinking in British uh, policy. Uh, and I think what Britain wants to do is to be in control uh, of uh, events, uh, or to at least give the perception of being in control of events, which may be spiraling out of control in reality. It certainly doesn't want to give the impression, as we'll see later on, uh, of uh, a retreat. Uh, it's got to be something which has seen uh, decolonization uh, and partition of the subcontinents linked in with this as a success story. That's very difficult to sell, of course, with the uh, massacres and migrations which actually accompany uh, the partition. But the aim in all of this is to try and maintain British prestige. This is where Mountbatten's role comes in. Uh, as Viceroy, to try and maintain British prestige and not to be signalling uh, to the United States or, or, to, or to the wider world that Britain is in retreat and decline. That is not the story, not the narrative uh, that needs to be told. Um, and I think we're here in Aisha Jalal's paper that um, there's lots of different narratives that uh, people with interest are trying to tell about uh, independence of the Indian subcontinent, uh, about what uh, it means for the creation of Pakistan, and indeed uh, different narratives in terms of who to blame for what went wrong. And that fact is obviously uh, often the person that is uh, earmarked as the person to blame. Uh, and also narratives about, uh, is this a fulfillment? of uh, British rule, the whole transfer of power, the language that you use, we've already heard that in terms of partition, the language which is used in itself uh, is influential in terms of a story, a historical narrative that's trying to be told. So transfer of power itself uh, indicates a, a notion of uh, a natural evolution to independence, rather than something which is outside of, uh, perhaps, uh, British control. So, uh, strategic thinking and British policy, I think, are very important. Uh, and then, of course, while I'm making this statement, uh, I'm inevitably indicating that uh, when Britain hands over power, which eventually turns out to be independence, along with partition, uh, it's Britain putting its interests first. It's Britain's interest first as a um, still an imperial power. It's Britain and it, its interest first in terms of not wanting lots of British troops to be returning in body bags uh, as a result of them getting caught in the middle uh, of a communal conflict, as it's understood. It, it's Britain's interest first in trying to preserve some of the elements uh, that it traditionally had in terms of the strategic value uh, of the subcontinent uh, for this wider uh, British Empire, which of course is still extending uh, to the Far East, as it was called in those days, after uh, Indian independence still includes large areas of Africa, uh, and still of course requires uh, secure communication links between Britain and um, New Zealand and Australia. So that those are the interests, uh, really, that uh, Britain uh, is trying to pursue. <coughs> so the role of Mountbatten, uh, and the, I've put on this heading here, myth and reality, and, th and there's so much myth surrounding Mountbatten's role uh, in all of this. Much of this myth, of course, is of his own making. Uh, and that he tries to give the impression that he's the person who was holding in the palm of his hand almost uh, the whole future of the subcontinent, that he is the man who is um, sort of in control uh, and achieving, uh, from his perspective, a successful uh, transfer of power. Uh, and of course that myth, which uh, was helped to be created uh, by um, both 
uh, Van Buren's actions at the time and the way they were presented by Alan Campbell Johnson, his present attaché, the first spin doctor, you could say, uh, of um, an end of empire situation. Uh, Van Buren, the fact that there's the archive, which is, uh, I've already mentioned, at Southampton University, which is purchased at considerable cost from Broadlands, just down the road, uh, from the University of Southampton. The, the fact that uh, Mountbatten created this archive uh, was all part of this mythologizing uh, of his role and trying to present his uh, vision uh, uh, of uh, what he achieved uh, in, in partition. So there is this myth uh, that um, Mountbatten created and of course this myth in itself leaves him open to criticism. Because if he is all-powerful in the way that he presents himself, then you can attach a lot of the blame for the failings uh, that accompany partition. You know, and, and this is a human tragedy of the greater scale. I mean, we're talking about uh, 16 million people uprooted. We've already heard about the scars of partition, which still uh, impact our relations between India and Pakistan today. Uh, a million people, or perhaps more than a million people, die as a result of uh, the, the violence at the time, which you could argue uh, the British could have done more to prevent. Uh, so that um, all of this um, tragedy of partition, if Mountbatten builds himself up as this great figure who is in control, uh, all of this can be attached to him, and it's his fault uh, for uh, these uh, human uh, tragedies which accompany partition. Certainly, uh, and I don't want to go in, it's not the, the main focus of my paper, it would be a digression, all of the ins and outs of where Mountbatten failed, where he might have done things differently. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, by creating this uh, image of himself as the person in control, uh, he's also opening himself up uh, for criticism. And this is why, of course, the Viceroyalty is still today of Mountbatten so immensely controversial. Reluctant partition. Um, what do we mean by this? Uh, is this just again a, a, a sort of um, a British narrative which has been created to try and deflect blame for the failings uh, and the tragedies uh, which accompany? Uh, partition. Obviously there's that element uh, in it, but I think that we need to go beyond this uh, for two very important reasons. Firstly, um, as far as partition was concerned from the British perspective, as I've said already in strategic terms, it could be a disaster uh, for Britain, strategically. Uh, so for that reason, uh, there is a reluctance. And the reluctance isn't um, sort of just about Pakistan's potential military weakness and the division uh, of the uh, Indian Army and how that undermines the Indian Army's ability to underpin uh, British power in the world. But there, there are also, if you read uh, in the India office particularly, there's lots of reports about um, Pakistan's possible uh, inability uh, to survive economically. Uh, and that is also feeds into, of course, how, if that's the case, could it maintain the role of that part of the subcontinent in terms of protecting the whole of the subcontinent from, obviously, potential uh, invasion from the Soviet Union, for example, or China. So there is this reluctance. It's not just about undermining the prestige of Britain's um, self-role of unifying, but also um, these strategic concerns. So I think that reluctant partition is, is certainly um, not just a creation uh, of a narrative uh, in terms of trying to um, present the best possible case. And certainly what is very interesting is if you go really dig deep into the Mountbatten papers, you'll see that uh, even at the sixth staff meeting on the 31st of March, 1947, 
there was still a discussion going on about a constitutional solution uh, which involved going back to the cabinet mission proposals of the previous summer, uh, which would have given, uh, obviously, a lot of devolved power uh, within the subcontinent, but within the frame uh, of uh, an all India union. Certainly, Mount Batten, there's no evidence in the records that he went to India with a predetermined partition plan in his head. Uh, that doesn't seem to, uh, to be there in the records. Um, that leads on, of course, to the next point. Uh, it's not just the British, perhaps, who are reluctantly accepting partition, uh, but also uh, the Indian National Congress reluctantly accepted partition. The Indian National Congress, as we all know, uh, had always stood for a, a unified view uh, of uh, India. Uh, it did not uh, sort of put forward any proposals at all uh, for partition. Uh, and indeed, Nehru, in many senses, articulated the view uh, that uh, Indian unity uh, was the most important thing going forward. So why is it that the Congress um, accepts partition? Uh, and what is the importance of this for Britain? Uh, I'll, I'll tackle the second question first. What is important for Britain is Britain does not want to appear, or even not just appear, but actually enforce partition on the Indian parties. If it does have to do this, or it appears to have done this, this could be very damaging to British long-term interests in the subcontinent. And, and that goes back to my original point about the strategic value and about the fact that the Britain, in a sense, um, although the reality doesn't ever work out this way, is searching for some kind of means of still having power and influence in the Indian subcontinent despite independence. And indeed, in an odd sort of way, independence is a way of delivering future influence. Uh, for, for Britain, without having the responsibility in a diminished uh, power uh, resource to actually have to rule, but to maintain it. <coughs> so it's important for Britain that the Congress agrees, and it can't be something that's imposed uh, on uh, the Congress. That needs to open the question, why does the Congress agree to partition? I'm not going to go into all of this because Aisha, I'm sure in her paper, is going to be mentioning uh, partly some of the reasons why Congress accepted it. And it does boil down to a number of factors, one of which, of course, is that Nehru does want a strong centre in order to uh, develop and modernise uh, uh, India. And, and he feels that this may be more easily achieved by shearing off, perhaps, uh, certain uh, areas. But uh, Nehru is also, of course, not wanting a balkanization of the subcontinent uh, or a big Pakistan. And this is where the squeezing <laughs> argument uh, comes in. A moth eaten Pakistan is often the terminology which is given, which means that um, Punjab and Bengal, two major Muslim majority provinces, uh, but with areas with significant uh, non-Muslim majorities also, uh, these are to be divided. So partition is not just the partition of the subcontinent, but partition is also the division uh, of uh, Punjab uh, and uh, Bengal. And of course this suits the Congress position. Uh, it doesn't necessarily want the big Pakistan. Uh, and also, of course, uh, from the Congress perspective, and, and no one, of course, We've got to say here, anticipates the economic and human costs that the partition uh, of Punjab and Bengal uh, is going to bring in its way. Uh, but uh, Congress may see that a moth eaten Pakistan with a strong center for India uh, it is uh, the best way forward for getting a relatively speedy British decolonization. 
And the British, of course, also begin to see uh, partition. Because uh, Mountbatten holds numerous interviews in the first month in which he is uh, in situ at, as uh, Viceroy. And it's only only after all of these interviews across Indian political parties, uh, with journalists uh, and, and other people, that he really comes down to the idea that uh, partition is the option uh, for delivering uh, British um, departure uh, from the subcontinent. And there's a, a convergence uh, in this period of time of, of uh, British interests in the kind of partition, not just partition, but what kind of partition are we going to have? And there's a convergence uh, in the um, Congress and the British uh, view of what kind of partition may deliver the things that both parties want after independence. Uh, uh, and, and that's why um, the British don't have to impose the, uh, any partition, but it's something which is accepted uh, by the Congress. Obviously, the Muslim League's in a weak position. Uh, Aisha Jalal's work has shown how Jinnah is uh, in, really boxed into a corner, and the Muslim League's in a weak position, and it comes down to it has to accept anything, even if it's a moth in Pakistan by this juncture. The stage managing uh, of independence and partition. Uh, again, Mountbatten is a crucial role here uh, because this is going to be a successful uh, Wavell had already been really quite unceremoniously sacked as Viceroy because he uh, was seen by uh, the Labour government in London as defeatist, as he was seen as someone with his breakdown plan that was going to present a view of the British departure from India as an imperial retreat rather than as this transfer of power and natural evolution uh, of British policy. This was the story uh, that uh, the cabinet had decided that it wanted to have told. Uh, so Mount Batten, in a way, um, it is uh, seen as a figure who can help deliver this. Uh, and of course, you have this um, track record that he already uh, in uh, Southeast Asia command with Alan Campbell Johnson, his future press attaché alongside him, developed uh, the use of the press. He's already very much into public relations. Uh, he's very much, um, because of his own ego, <laughs> wanting to put himself forward uh, in a positive light. He's good at manipulating the media and film. It's very modern uh, in this sense. Uh, and the whole aim, really, of the stage managing of independence and partition is, is of course, for the British to try and present this uh, as, as a success. Uh, and um, so Mountbatten gets it filmed. Um, he gets it clearly agreed with Nehru that there should be no um, obvious sign of the lowering of the Union Jack in any of these film strips, uh, because this will look like Britain defeat, uh, so that uh, it, it's a, it's a stage-managed uh, process, which Mountbatten is probably the best person to fulfill. However, of course, the partition violence begins almost immediately afterwards, and this uh, is much more difficult, because you're then getting stories coming out which are of a negative rather than a positive nature. The Commonwealth moment, uh, basically um, one of Mountbatten's key aims uh, was that um, India and Pakistan would join the Commonwealth. He sees this uh, from as early as April 1947 as one of his key priorities. Uh, why is this? Again, it's because of the uh, evolution of the Commonwealth. Uh, and, and a, a success story, these two um, new Asian powers uh, taking their place in the Commonwealth uh, alongside the old established white dominions within the Commonwealth. Uh, so that's one um, sort of positive story that, that uh, the British wanted to tell. But also Commonwealth membership, and this links back to the strategic issue, Commonwealth membership would mean uh, 
that uh, there wouldn't have to be a military treaty signed to secure British interest in the Far East uh, if these two countries are within the Commonwealth. Uh, they could still be uh, in involved, so the British hoped, uh, in uh, their strategic uh, concerns. So the Commonwealth moment uh, is a great hope, uh, and the Commonwealth is to serve Britain's interests as a continuing great power. That's important to bear in mind. I wouldn't go quite so far as to say a substitute empire, but it's sort of, uh, that's the way some people are thinking about it uh, in, in London. Uh, but of course it doesn't happen, okay, babe. it doesn't happen in that way, in part because of the emergence of the Kashmir dispute, which throws everything out as far as Britain's hopes for uh, the Commonwealth are concerned. Uh, there's the embarrassment of two Commonwealth members being at war with each other. The whole evolution of the Commonwealth is disrupted uh, by this. And also the hopes that somehow or other uh, there could be a strategic military interest still served by the subcontinent after independence. Uh, it's all thrown out by the Kashmir issue, which of course is often seen as part of the unfinished business uh, of partition. So, just to sort of round up the last minute or two, linkages and comparative dimensions. Um, in many senses, of course, I'm arguing this, this is a unique set of circumstances. Uh, it's something which is agreed upon very late in the day, the partition. It's something which is, certainly doesn't have the years of discussion and planning that Palestine does. And we've already heard that uh, it's very different anyway because it's uh, the difference between a mandated territory bringing other uh, powers into play in the British decolonization. There are similar contexts. One of them, of course, is that in both instances, partition is still seen as part of the decolonization process, uh, which is not to show British defeat. Uh, and is part of a British process of still trying to maintain itself. Because we've got to remember that right the way down to the Suez crisis, Britain still has pretensions of being a great power uh, after the Second World War. And also the other similarity is this context of ethnic conflict, communal conflict, uh, and the debate about whether or not British troops should be committed in that context, uh, and uh, how um, Perhaps um, partition could be a way of speeding up uh, what is seen as an uh, end of empire or end of mandate uh, situation, which is threatening uh, Britain's prestige uh, and, and its strategic influences. Uh, so there are similarities as well as obviously uh, considerable uh, differences between uh, these two partitions, but I think that, um, as we'll see hopefully in some of the later papers, uh, uh, there is more scope, I think, for comparative study than has happened before, and certainly um, from the subcontinental perspective, there hasn't really been that sustained uh, interest in comparing uh, these two partitions. Thank you. So 
One question is really about the nature of the archives, and I have seen references to Alan Campbell Johnson, his press Tashi's archives also. So in some ways, he, he began by crafting the narrative very early on, and I think one of the first uh, manifestations of that was Alan Campbell Jones' narrative of uh, memoirs. So in some ways, I would ask you about how can one critically interrogate this archive? This is one question. The second is I think you are very persuasive about what you say about the complicity between him and the convergence of ideas which emerges. How he's a reluctant partitionist, I think that is a point which can be accepted given the British thinking uh, about it uh, in, in, the, in the 40s after the war. But, you know, the, and one can see the ground convergence between him and the Congress to some extent about the principle of partition. Uh, and then the Congress was not alone. There was the Indian business, there were the Bengali Hindus. There were various constituencies who were interested in an early solution and partition appeared as the early solution. But my questions really are about the format of partition, particularly his role about the third rule plan and the uh, way the boundary commission was set up, its terms of reference, uh, its wording. So I, I think these are the questions which persist about Martin Batten's role. Uh, so could you please tell us something about the third rule plan uh, and the boundary commission? For example, why was the Boundary Commission? Uh, it could have produced a verdict which may have been subject to arbitration. Why was the verdict produced which had to be arbitrary, final and absolute? Mm -hmm. So this is one question. Uh, of course, then why were the lawyers put in place? And they all represented, uh, you know, one, part, one side represented the Muslim League, other side represented the Congress. So it had to produce that kind of outcome of the divided world. So these are negative questions which remain. Uh, my final comment is really about the, what you say about the Commonwealth, the expectation that Commonwealth will be a kind of a defense organization like the NATO. Uh, that did not really have work out. That did not really work out. And the 1954 arrangements came much later. But in between, there were a lot of, there was this interregnum which did not produce the kind of expectations which the British had about the security regime in this region. So, it comes about that. And then, of course, there are questions which come to yeah. Maybe you want to respond. Okay, yes. Um, I mean, what is interesting about the composition of the Boundary Commission is that Oscar Spate one of the few geographers who was actually involved in this. Most of the people uh, who were making the presentations uh, from the various parties or, or sitting in judgment on this uh, were lawyers. Going back to the point about the role of lawyers uh, in partition. Um, the issue of um, Mountbatten's role in this and whether or not, of course, he influenced the Boundary Commission is that one of the numerous controversies surrounding the, uh, the Mountbatten Viceroyalty. Um, certainly, uh, from within Pakistan, the view would very much be that uh, this is one of the key examples uh, of Mountbatten's pro-India bias uh, at the end of empire. Uh, there's talk, of course, of the Gurdaspur district, which had a bare Muslim majority uh, being awarded uh, to India, uh, and uh, that is a feature in some of the communal violence. I think um, if you look at the work of Lucy Chester on uh, the Boundary Commission, uh, she's written quite extensively on this, uh, one of the things which comes out is that the, the Boundary Commission is, is part of the whole um, smoke and mirrors job uh, which the British uh, are engaged in, to try and give an impression that they are in control of the situation uh, relating to transfer of power. Uh, and that uh, this is a, a, a means uh, of, of doing that. And I think that um, certainly the Boundary Commission and the way in which it operated raised tensions uh, before the British actual 
transfer power. Uh, and it's a factor in why um, the third of June plan, the partition plan, didn't resolve the crisis. Because the whole idea of partition was sold on the basis that uh, partition would be a means to ending this uh, violence and political conflict which had racked the subcontinent uh, for a year or more. Uh, and of course it doesn't. Uh, it just opens the way to the terrible human tragedy that we been referring to. Uh, and I think that part of it is, is because of the fact that there wasn't um, any sense uh, at the time of the Boundary Commission or when the committees were sitting dividing assets uh, that um, there, there was any trust between the Muslim League and Congress in this. There wasn't any sense, I think, at all that the British and certainly Manhattan from the Muslim League perspective was seen very much a pro-Indian figure. Uh, so there wasn't uh, a means through this partition machinery. Uh, and there's not much, much being written about the actual partition machinery, going back to the, you know, the point about where can we, we're going back to the high politics, what can we look at? The, the partition machinery itself is flawed. Uh, and as a result of that, it doesn't resolve conflicts, but just creates new arenas uh, for conflict uh, between the parties. And I think that's quite important. Um, and of course there's the whole issue of whether this is all too rushed, but I haven't got time to go into that, but whether it had been a longer uh, and slower process working its way through, whether there would have been less violence. Um, so I, I think that's where the Boundary Commission comes in. But the, the composition of the Boundary Commission uh, is failing, I think, are very important. Um, in terms of the archive, yes, I mean, as with any archive, often it's the silences in the archive which are more telling than the actual documents which are there. Uh, there may be more papers going to be released, um, but that needs Cabinet Office approval. Uh, from the Mountbatten Archive, which is actually held at the University of Southampton in the next 18 months or so. Um, and, and certainly, yes, I mean, Mission with Mountbatten, Alan Campbell Johnson's memoir, uh, really was establishing uh, the, the Mountbatten myth in terms of his role from a very early stage uh, in the uh, narrativization uh, of the transfer of power. Uh, and that's all part, I think, of this trying to uh, sort of establish a, a particular narrative from the British perspective. And of course, um, the British are trying to create their narrative, and the post independent Indian and Pakistan states have created their own narratives. Uh, so that's important also to bear in mind that this isn't just a British thing that we're talking about. All these these parties are there, in a sense, and trying to present a view of partition uh, that, that serves either an imperial or a national interest. Okay, so, uh, I think we will um, come to the Q&A. There will be an opportunity for Q&A for both the, both the papers. I've just been instructed, given this instruction. So we will move on to the next presentation by Professor Rashid Jalal. Um, Professor Jalal is uh, based at the University of Tufts in the US. She is the Mary Richardson Professor of History, where she teaches at the History Department and at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. She, her main works are the sole spokesman, Jinnah Muslim League in the Demand of Pakistan, published in 1985, The State of Martial Rule, The Origins of Pakistan's Political Economy and Defense, uh, Modern South Asia, History, Culture, and Political Economy, uh, co authored with Professor Shogata Bose, Sovereignty and Self, the Muslim Individual. Uh, more recently, she has uh, written a book on the pity of partnership. Mantos' lifetimes and work across the India-Pakistan divide. Uh, 
and of course a history of Pakistan, the struggle for Pakistan <coughs> and Muslim homeland and global politics, published by Howard University Press, 2014. Uh, may I request Mr. Jalal? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, speak on a subject uh, which I've thought about a great deal, uh, but you don't typically uh, have an interest in partition. Um, and, you know, apropos what Victor has set us up on what is partition, I think it depends a great deal uh, who is giving the answer, a lawyer, a historian, uh, or just an ordinary person. Uh, so what I do want to say, um, uh, just to preface my uh, presentation, which is drawn from a paper that I was asked to give, um, and just in the interest of, of time and uh, question and answers, I will draw upon that rather than speak, uh, because the subject I can speak for hours uh, on it. Uh, what I do want to say is that what is curious about partition, of course, is that you know, we talk about um, uh, the, the British, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that it's an act of state, and I agree with you, uh, but it's ultimately political. It's a product of political processes. Um, and I think here, uh, what we tend not to recognize is that uh, it depends on our ideas of not just spatiality, but also our ideas of identity and how we constitute, and this is something that uh, your paper brings up. Uh, and finally, I do think that what is recognized in the world, especially of the IR dominated world as a mode of conflict resolution, uh, conflict uh, management, um, arguably has become, uh, as Ian was referring to towards the end, um, a, a, a means of uh, not having conflict resolution. And I think that is what we need to discuss. Why is it that what was always perceived as a mode of conflict uh, management is in fact become a mode of the impossibility of resolution. And I think the reason uh, and where I want to begin uh, is precisely the human dimension uh, that uh, you were mentioning, that high politics and the human. And I think it's important to link those two rather than to see one as better than the other. Uh, and so there, um, I would like to, uh, I can get this one. Where do I point? Can you tell me where to point? into bewildering permutations and combinations. 
A partition uh, may have become a distant memory for many, and its implications in public discourse limited simply to scoring points uh, on the grid of national patriotism. But its absent presences in everyday life across the Great Divide of 1947 are indicators of its historical significance, not merely as an event that took place seven decades ago, but a process that is very much part of our present. An ongoing process uh, with neither end nor beginning, partition structures the post-colonial South Asian experience. It is the foundational myth of both nation states. An institutionalized form of dividing and uh, disconnecting partition um, remains uh, uh, the popular myth of both states and it ferrets out people, communities and linguistic uh, cultures um, that were once historically uh, that were once historically indivisible. If there are multiple slippages, elisions and contestations and narratives about the Great Divide that occurred uh, in 1947, there are also, as has been mentioned, strange silences about its constant reenactments uh, in the post-colonial uh, nation states of South Asia, uh, an issue that I would be very happy to elaborate upon uh, in question and answer. Uh, the nation uh, with a capital N, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves, Tagore, Rabindranath Tagore had won in his little book, Nationalism, published uh, uh, exactly a hundred uh, years ago, uh, uh, a little bit more than 100 years ago, with all its patriotic bragging, cannot hide the fact that the nation is the greatest evil for the nation. As the self-love of Western nations danced to the clash of steel in the killing fields of Europe and the Middle East, the Bengali poet warned his fellow countrymen against the hubris of jingoistic pride that was embodied in the model of the nation state. Muhammad Iqbal, uh, the Punjabi poet uh, philosopher uh, who wrote in Urdu uh, uh, in the early 20th century and is generally considered to be uh, the visionary of Pakistan, had shared many of Tagore's concerns uh, about the dangers of worshipping the god of nationalism. On the roots of conflict, however, Iqbal had a final insight. In his considered view, it was nationalism that gave rise to the relativity of religions. The notion that religions were territorially specific and unsuited to the temperament of other nations. It was nationalism, therefore, and not religion, which, by compartmentalizing people into different nations, was the source of all the conflicts. This point of view uh, clashes with common uh, perceptions of religions, all pervasive role in uh, South Asia. So it's not just coming to terms with partition. Uh, but what exactly led to partition? Well, some people say it was uh, religion, religious passion, madness, communal madness. Others suggest that it may have to do uh, with uh, federalism, uh, a term that is not utilized very often when talking about partition causes. Uh, or others might even still say uh, that it had something to do with, uh, with conceptions of uh, our, uh, our conceptions of space, colonial conceptions of space, state conceptions of space. Um, so, we need to ask ourselves really whether categories of religion, uh, especially on which so many scholars have written uh, with great insight, uh, uh, should continue to be used in such blanket terms uh, to describe the fault lines of freedom, certainly in South Asia. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, is, is, is extremely important if we are going to progress towards a more uh, coherent, more meaningful discussion of partition, uh, as, as, at least in the subcontinental stage. Uh, the binary opposition between secular nationalism and religious communalism, which is constantly invoked, is completely hopeless and inadequate for such an enterprise. Uh, it seems far more prudent uh, to take stock of the subcontinent's past and present without making facile distinctions between the religious and the secular, the emotional and the rational, or the nationalist and the communalist. Uh, for purposes of conceptual clarity, uh, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of the subtle but important difference between religion as faith, a matter of personal faith, and religion as a social demarcator of identity. While religion as faith can be seen as a matter of personal belief, uh, religion as social demarcator uh, aims spe specifically at establishing boundaries with other communities. It is a distancing with others, not something uh, that is getting attributed. 
personal belief necessarily. A divorce critique of the aggressive nationalisms of modern nation states, along with its promotion of universalism, was not devoid of a religious sensibility. Iqbal envisaged Islam as a universal religion, which was neither national and racial, nor individual and private, but purely human. Religion as social demarcator, as both men knew from personal experience, was a mere label, not an accurate reflection of the religiosity of the individual believer, far less of the community uh, or the nation. Both men, in their different ways, affirmed the inextricable overlap between temporal and spiritual life. All human life is spiritual, uh, Iqbal had argued. Uh, there was no such thing as a profane world. Uh, in their different ways, uh, Tagore and Iqbal had pinpointed the dangers of letting religion as social demarcator appropriate the meaning, scope, and spirit of religion. Instead of translating Tagore's and Iqbal's ideas into practice, uh, it proved easier for uh, the managers of the post-colonial nation states of South Asia to appropriate them for their respective national agendas. If the differences between Mohandas Karanchand Gandhi and Muhammad Ali Jinnah give a quintessential glimpse into the contrasts between the acknowledged fathers of independent India and Pakistan, the similarities between Tagore and Iqbal capture the as yet unrealized but potentially dynamic ability of these two congenital rivals to strike at some common chords. The potential, unfortunately, was not realized in the bitter end game of the British Raj. Uh, as Manto observed then, uh, previously religion used to reside in the heart. Now it resided in caps, whether the Gandhi or the Jinnah cap, long live caps. A partition of India along self professedly religious lines is, of course, lent a teleological tendency uh, to the processes of historical retreat, uh, which has not been easy to shrug. It was mainly religion as social demarcator rather than concerns with religion as faith. Uh, not the dream of an Islamic theocracy, which informed the All India Muslim League's demand for a Pakistan in March 1940. For all those who constantly talk about partition as caused by religion, I'd like them to give me one instance of a major debate between the politicians of um, the Muslim League and the Congress on religion, uh, on theology. This was not a theological debate, this was a political debate. Why are we so uh, averse to calling what is political? Uh, and, and calling it religious. And I think this is something which is the main problem of not being able to come to terms with partition. Um, while the insistence, um, you see, in putting forward a claim to nationhood, Indian Muslims were decidedly revolting against minoritarianism, caricatured as religious communalism. While the insistence on national status for Indian Muslims was absolute, uh, the demand for a separate and sovereign state and its relationship with Hindustan containing almost as many Muslims remained open to negotiations until the late summer of 1946. And I'd like to uh, just sort of take you through this Gavin Krishna plan, uh, which uh, provided uh, a, more, a, a, a solution for a three-tiered solution uh, for an All India Federation, uh, with grouping of provinces A consisting of the Hindu majority provinces, a grouping of provinces B consisting of the Muslim majority provinces of the Northwest, uh, and then grouping of provinces C uh, consisting of Bengal and Assam in the Northeast, and of course the third tier being other provinces. Uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make here, and you all know that Jinnah accepted this um, uh, before um, Nehru came out uh, on uh, uh, the, the, of July 11th, 46, since 1946, and said that they were not prepared to accept uh, either grouping or a center restricted to uh, three subjects. Uh, and who were the British to tell uh, the Indian Constitution Assembly how to frame their constitution? Before that, um, what I want to say is the claim that Muslims constituted a nation was not incompatible, as Jinnah's acceptance of this uh, suggests, with a federal or confederal structure covering the whole of India. Uh, but for the federal idea to be accepted, the logic of majoritarianism and minoritarianism had to be abandoned and the fact of contested sovereignty acknowledged. This was about our sharing. I've been here uh, since 9 o'clock in the morning and haven't heard the word, so let me introduce the most important word, power sharing. It is the failure of power sharing that leads to partitions. In keeping with a better part of India's history, the overture of shared sovereignty 
enunciated by General and Mr. Leake, seemed the best way of tackling the dilemma posed by the absence of any neat equation between Muslim identity and territory. With nations struggling states, the boundaries between them had to be permeable and flexible, not impenetrable and absolute. This is why Jinnah and the League remained implacably opposed to the partition of Punjab and Bengal uh, along religious lines, even while furthering the cause of a political division of India between Pakistan and Hindustan. Uh, Ian referred to this uh, earlier. Uh, I will go so far as to say that the partition of India is effectively the partition of Punjab and Bengal. In the event, it was ironically enough, the Congress backed by the extreme right-wing Hindu Mahasa, which plumped for a partition of the two main Muslim majority provinces of India, conceding a Pakistan which both in its shape and form had been rejected out of hand uh, by its proclaimed architect on two separate occasions, uh, first in 1944 and then again in 46. So what did religion then have to do uh, uh, as faith had to do with the politics of difference um, in late colonial India. Very little, it was seen insofar as the main stumbling block to evolving a framework for a united India were power sharing arrangements between members of different religious communities um, at the All India level as well as uh, the key regions of Punjab and Bengal. Uh, prior to the British conquest, it really worth reminding people, uh, relations between regional peoples and the sovereign power had never been defined only by religion. Despite a long history of creatively accommodating multiple levels of uh, sovereignty, the renegotiations of the terms for sharing power in an independent India saw the privileging of a rigid and monolithic conception of territorial sovereignty, a special kind of speciality, based on a singular and homogenizing idea of the nation, the singularity of the nation. An insistence on the unity of the nation and the corresponding refusal to countenance internal differences eventually paved the way for a partition of the subcontinent along religious lines. In 1971, yet another partition occurred uh, when Pakistan's eastern wing, containing a majority of its Muslim population, broke away to form Bangladesh, uh, compounding the difficulties uh, of explaining these historical developments primarily in terms of religion. Uh, which I think uh, which obfuscates uh, the more significant uh, and enduring aspects of federalism. In one of uh, the more unforgettable contemporary recollections of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Beverly Nichols in uh, Verdict on India described the lanky and stylishly dressed barrister uh, as the most important man in Asia, looking every bit like a gentleman of Spain, of the old diplomatic school, the monocle wearing leader of the All India Muslim League had a pivotal place uh, in India's future. If Gandhi goes, there is Nehru, Rajagopalacharya, Patel, and a dozen others. But if Jinnah goes, who is there? Without the Kaide Azam to steer the course, uh, the Muslim League was a divisive and potentially explosive force uh, that uh, Nichols noted might run completely off the rails and charge through India with fire and slaughter. It might even start another war. As long as Jinnah was around, nothing disastrous was likely to happen. And so Nichols quipped, a great deal hangs on the gray silk cord of that monocle. He was right. Jinnah was a crucial link between the Congress and the Muslim League, which if broken could catapult India into disaster. While regaling journalists at a tea party in his honor uh, at Allahabad in April of 1942, uh, two years um, before, um, sorry, two years after the formal orchestration of the demand for Pakistan by the All India Muslim League, Jinnah had emphatically denied harboring the slightest ill will against Hindus or any other community. Drawing an analogy between himself and the first man uh, to appear on the street with an umbrella, uh, only to be laughed and scorned at by the crowd that had never seen an umbrella before, uh, he said self assuredly, You may laugh at me. But the time will soon come when you will not only understand what the umbrella is, but use it to the advantage of every one of you. Jinnah's work, of course, remains unrealized, making it all the more difficult to restore his proper place in history, far less the proper place of partition. Um, a skillful lawyer who won the respect of his peers at the bar, he imagined himself as someone who could bridge the communitarian differences 
uh, which, uh, in this opinion, were the biggest obstacle uh, to India winning freedom. Fate deemed otherwise. Uh, Jinnah had hoped to negotiate a constitutional arrangement based on power sharing uh, between the Congress and the Muslim League, uh, representing Hindus and Muslims respectively. Uh, but then, of course, we know that even great men uh, make history under extreme constraints. Uh, many find it remarkable, uh, and go on about this endlessly, certainly in his home country, Pakistan, that Jinnah made history despite overwhelming odds. I would humble, uh, humbly add uh, that while this explains the attention given to his role in the creation of Pakistan, what is ignored in all of this is that if there has been a, a bit too much focus on the history Jinnah made, uh, there is still much to be said about the history that made Jinnah. Throughout his long and checkered career, uh, Jinnah remained remarkably consistent about his main political objectives. He had begun his journey as a congressman, um, seeking a share of power for Indians at the All India Center. Since Muslims were a minority, uh, in the limited system of representation in colonial India, he became an ardent champion of minority rights as a necessary step towards Hindu-Muslim uh, 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 union um, uh, and Congress and Congress League cooperation. The provincial bias in British constitutional reforms after 1990 tested the resilience of a centralist politician with all India ambitions. As a constitutionalist of rare skill and vision, Jinnah tried reconciling communitarian and provincial interests while always holding out an olive branch to Congress. While his insistence on national status for Indian Muslims remained absolute after 1940, the demand for a separate and sovereign state, as I've already suggested, remained open to negotiation until the late summer of 1946. He was acutely aware that almost as many members of the Muslim nation would reside in what he always referred to as Hindustan and not India, in this, and, and, and I mean, they, they would be outside um, uh, the Muslim homeland. Zafrullah Khan, that um, uh, Victor has mentioned, had noted uh, in February 1940 in his memo uh, that a partition resulting in an exchange of population was utterly impractical uh, and would result in nothing but misery and suffering. Uh, the claim to nationhood was not an inevitable overture uh, to, uh, to, to, <coughs> to separate statehood, an analytical distinction between a division of sovereignty within India and a partition of the provinces enables a precise understanding of the demand for a Pakistan. On achieving Pakistan, Ajana was categorical that equal citizenship and an assurance of minority rights would form the basis of a new state. Um, there's been a growing recognition amongst uh, sections of the scholarly community in India and Pakistan and abroad uh, that partition was the price that had to be paid uh, for the Congress to inherit British India's unitary center and integrate the princely states. Uh, history has a way of laying bare what is hidden or suppressed by individual and collective memory, an intrinsic unity in division that no amount of mechanical cartography can face. Seventy years after partition and independence, uh, uh, the Navy, uh, I mean, uh, and the establishment of Pakistan's Eastern Wing and Bangladesh 50 years ago, the long history that binds the subcontinent's diverse peoples and um, uh, cultures uh, has not really receded completely into oblivion. It is, if anything, more present than ever, a veritable summons for those with daring to penetrate the veils that have been used to deny interconnections, whether in the name of region, religion, or nation. Ram Mohan Lohia, Ram Manohar Lohia recalled a private conversation in Noakhali with Nehru at the instance of Mohandas Gandhi um, in November of 1946. And I quote, Mr. Nehru spoke of the water, slime, bush, and tree, Lohia wrote, that he found everywhere in East Bengal. He said that this was not the India he or I knew and wanted uh, with some vehemence to cut East Bengal away from the mainland of India. Lohia found this to be an extraordinary observation. He noted, these reasons of geography might under some circumstances, Lohia commented, prove how necessary it is for the Ganga and the Jamuna plains to stay united with their luxuriant terminus. But once the idea of partition came to be accepted as a condition precedent to India's freedom, no matter what, uh, that the acceptance was still very private and not even communi communicated to Gandhi, 
the geography of East Bengal could well become abominable. Much the same, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, I think for those who don't know, uh, the Gangetic, uh, uh, this alluvium is the, is, the, is the longest unbroken alluvium in the world. Um, so I think this is something worth working out. Uh, this is so much the same kind of thinking as Gloria. Uh, players to have guided uh, the view of a major science uh, conference held in Delhi in the early 1950s. That the separation of Burma, uh, May and March today, India and Pakistan was, quote, a geological, geographical, and economic crime that flew in the face of nature and was unlikely to last for more than a century or two. The theories of nature have yet, so, so far, failed to shape the resolve of the post-colonial states to uphold their hostile postures and reject uh, calls for cooperation across arbitrarily, uh, and continue to reject calls for cooperation across arbitrarily drawn frontiers. Um, it remains to be seen, seen, however, whether human nature or mother nature will have the final laugh. And finally, um, opposed to the partition of Punjab and Bengal until mid 1947, Jinnah was checkmated at the end game um, of the Raj by the votaries of uh, unitary and monolithic sovereignty. The precedent for such partitions uh, had been set uh, with the partition of the province of Ulster in the aftermath of World War I. In that sense, the partition of India was not paradigmatic, but may have tilted the balance uh, against a binational state and towards partition in Palestine. Jinnah's constitutional insights into the imperatives of forging new Indian Union, once the British quit, um, resonated well with a long established tradition of South Asia uh, based on layered and shared sovereignties. Uh, the four decades since uh, the end of World War II were a heyday of indivisible sovereignty across the globe. Since the late 1980s, however, there has been a perceptible weakening uh, in the hold of that dogma. Uh, Jinnah's legacy, uh, I believe, um, and I think uh, one of the reasons I'm here, is especially pertinent uh, to the enterprise of rethinking not just the validity of partitions, but most importantly of sovereignty in South Asia and beyond in the 21st century. If India and Pakistan can shed the dead weight of the colonial inheritance uh, of non-negotiable sovereignty and hard borders, uh, which has been at the root of uh, their animosities, a South Asian Union of sorts may yet come about under the capacious cover of Jinnah's metaphorical umbrella. His hope that Hindus, quite as much as Muslims, would one day bless the memory of his name has also not been fulfilled. Uh, but uh, moves in that direction have been in evidence more recently. The Indian Prime Minister, Rajpai, Adal Bahari Rajpai, made a point of visiting the venue where the Lahore Resolution of 1940 was adopted by the Muslim League. This was followed by the Hindu nationalist leader, Lal Krishna Advani's homage to the founding father of Pakistan, at his Musulman uh, in Karachi. Uh, but it's also worth remembering that more than seven decades after partition, uh, the world second decade after, after partition, and the Bimali leader, uh, Sarat Chandra Bose, uh, in his obituary comment on Jinnah's death, paid tribute to the memory of one who was great as a lawyer, once great as a congressman, great as a leader of Muslims, great as a world politician and diplomat, and greatest of all, a man of action. It is just sad that uh, the attempted conflict resolution has made his ideas, has immersed his ideas, making conflict resolution impossible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that uh, very interesting, very insightful presentation. Um, before I, you know, open the floor for questions, may I begin by asking a question? Uh, Professor Jalal, you talked about uh, this very important idea of shared multi-layered sovereignty, which, which you think is important to understand in that. And of course, the cabinet mission plan in some ways incorporated that idea. Uh, now, if we pursue this idea that you know, Jinnah has this commitment to this shared multi-layered multi sovereignty and how this is aligned to South Asian political traditions, going back, for example, to the Mughal, to the Mughals, or even British India, where the princely state and the, and the, the paramount power, there is a kind of sharing of sovereignty. But how does this tally 
how does it square up with Jinnah's political language in the 40s when he's talking a, a lot about parity? So he's saying British, there is British in, there are three parties in India: the British, the Hindus, and the Muslims. So how does this square up? Well, I mean, I think you'd agree with me that politics is the art of the possible. So it's a matter of negotiation. I mean, he's famously famously said that, you know, in the Congress you have to ask for 16 hours in order to get age. Uh, so I think asking for parity or an equitable share of power, uh, I mean, in these terms may be used interchangeably, equitable or parity. Uh, he would have liked something close to parity, but was realistic enough to realize it was not possible. So I mean, equitable share of power was the alternative. Uh, so I think it was a question of give and take. It was a question of constant negotiation, but the Congress seeing the cake within their reach, uh, chose to go for a united uh, option, I mean, a, un a unitary center, and that the price was uh, Pakistan, so be it. Uh, I mean, who can deny uh, the, 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 the attractions to uh, Jawaharlal Nehru of a divided Punjab and divided Bengal? Because I think what people don't realize 70 years hence is that if there had been no partition of Punjab and Bengal, there would have been no Nehru dynasty. So on that um, very interesting idea and insight, I think, uh, may I request uh, questions from the floor, Professor Ambassador Chaudhary uh, indicated that. And then we will take a couple of questions and then uh, perhaps, so uh, Ambassador Chaudhary, Mr. Chumabhai, and the gentleman there in that. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, uh, extremely uh, interesting presentations. Uh, by both speakers. Uh, just to cut the chase. Request that you specify to whom the yeah. question is addressed. Uh, this question is addressed, I assume, to both, because there will be two, two quick questions. Uh, one is with regard to uh, the first partition in British India, which was uh, actually not so much the partition of Punjab, but the partition of Bengal, the Bengal Presidency. This was 1905. That was the partition mark one. First time, uh, Bengal was partitioned into West and East Bengal. The reason why that becomes very contemporaneous now is because of another evolving situation, which is very contemporary in relations, which is the partition of Assam, which was, by the way, the third partition. Uh, uh, Professor, you know, you mentioned that it was uh, partition of Punjab and Bengal, of course, but also Assam, unbeknownst to many, was also partitioned because a bit of Assam was hived off from Assad so and, and Rafael got to uh, East Pakistan, which has ramifications for politics yeah. today. So, uh, Bengal was for, for the relief of Bengal and reinvigoration of Assam, as Chris has said. So, that was the first partition. The second partition, of course, was supposed to 47. The third partition is, is 1975. So, this to you, sir. Uh, is this in some ways the fruition of the cabinet regime plan? Uh, once, when I was a, a young officer, I worked with uh, Arthur Bottomley, who, who had worked with Lady Alexander. And Bottomley had said that, you know, what's happening now in 71 is really the fruition of the cabinet mission plan. Because the Group A, India, uh, Group B, uh, Pakistan, and there's a Bengal Assam, okay, Assam wasn't there then. Bengal emerging as, as a third independent state, and that's exactly what, what the Jung War, 47, 46, had aimed at, I mean, they hadn't conceived sovereignty in that fashion, but these were three sovereign states emerging on the web level plan. To you, Madam, uh, I mean, Professor, uh, the, uh, uh, the third partition is Assam partition. You know, you mentioned Manto's, uh, uh, Manto, and Manto had this uh, pretty powerful satire called Toba Teg Singh. Toba Teg Singh, uh, 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 about this person, I think his name is Bishan Singh, who doesn't quite know whether he's called Bishan Singh who doesn't quite know whether he belongs to, uh, uh, he is from Toba Teksi, but Toba Teksi goes to Pakistan. What is happening in Assam today is a bit like uh, Vishen Singh, because uh, for a Bengali Muslim, uh, uh, Sirat is now lost to, uh, to Bengal Assam, Bengali Assam is in, in now uh, uh, Bangladesh. So he feels, uh, or she feels absolutely lost, and there are four million of them in Assam today. There's nothing, in Germany, and the numbers are huge, huge far, far more than was the case in Bengal and Punjab. So what's going to happen now 
is partition the evolving phenomena and uh, I'm continuing phenomena in, in subcontinent? Is partition a work in progress in subcontinent? Question to both. Yes, well, I, mean, I do think that I have to correct you. That if you're going to talk about the redrawing of provincial boundaries within existing nation states as partitions, then there have to be many, many more. Uh, you know, uh, there's currently talk about creating the South Punjab province in Pakistan. Is that a partition? I think my reference to the second partition is about the creation of a new country. Uh, 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 that's the partition I was talking to. I mean, India has had several redrawing of boundaries, and if you want to call them partitions, that's your problem. Partition between two sovereign states. I mind you, partition or Assam is part of it is in India. Well, fine, but it, it, the point is that, that, that I, mean, I think we can debate the, the value, but I think the partitions we are referring to is the creation of a, a separate state. But I, I mean, your, your question really is about are these going to continue? And my answer is that they will continue so long as you choose to uh, uh, separate uh, uh, rather than uh, share power. Uh, let me say that the, uh, as, a, as a paradigm, partition is constantly invoked uh, when, talk, when, when there's talk about Afghanistan or even Kashmir. And the problem is that creating uh, a, a, a wall between us that side and this side is, is, is fine. We can, we can choose to partition this room or divide this room, but we can still hear each other. Uh, and if you make noise, we can hear you. In other words, the whole point is about learning how to live with each other. 70 years plus India and Pakistan don't know how to live with each other. So this is why what is meant to be conflict management has turned into a mode of the inability to reach conflict resolution. So I do think that we need to look at partition from that perspective. Uh, that partition was a product of the shared, um, the failure of shared of, of our shared arrangements, which required um, some respect to India's federal form. Uh, but when you choose not to do that and go for a monolithic concept of sovereignty, uh, a singular nationhood that cannot uh, uh, harbor any degree of difference uh, uh, and division or contestation, then yes, you will continue to see many more nation hyphenated states in South Asia and elsewhere too. So it is a conceptual problem rather than one that emerges from intrinsic differences in people. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going back to the, um, the first partition in Bengal, the point we're making. Um, that's very different to the 1947 partition in the sense that it, it wasn't um, coming within a context of um, conflict and conflict resolution. The justification that Curzon came up with for it, you know, was to try and bring power down to a level that uh, was more meaningful for the local population. And this was too unwieldy uh, an administrative unit, uh, and that, of course, links much more with um, the point that I, I, should tell I was making. You know, that uh, there have been redrawing of boundaries within provinces for a long time on numerous occasions. You know, to try and bring power down to a level. Partition, it, it, as I think and this picks up on the, the lecture that we heard, it is usually perceived as in terms of some kind of conflict that needs to be resolved, rather than bringing power down to a level which is more meaningful uh, to, to, to a population. So there's been all kinds of re redrawing of boundaries on linguistic lines, uh, you know, within. Uh, India, certainly there's all talk within Pakistan at the moment, as I just said, of having a South Punjab um, province uh, to again deal with the same kind of issues that were there in the first partition of Bengal, to unwieldy uh, a provincial administration uh, and to reflect more uh, local sort of uh, interests. So I think we've got to be going back to the first lecture, very careful in terms of how you define partition, what partition is. Are we talking about the same kind of things all the time? I think that's important. Mr. Jumanpa, and can, can we take both the questions together? No, I just want some of my own recollections of that time. Uh, Mountbatten didn't allow the procedures that had been evolving in the separation. Uh, there was to be a separation of the 
British Indian Army, over Pakistan, civil services, all of these were already planned. Mount Batten suddenly decided when to declare it, and all those were left hanging in the mountains. And that created all these killings that took place afterwards. Uh, that was a fact that I was there. I just wanted to add this. Thank you. Okay, yes, my name is uh, Anish Mishra. Okay, my, my first question is on uh, the separate, it, separate, it, separate electorate. If we take one point, for example, the, the United Province, in the 1946 election, the Muslim League won 54 out of 228 seats. So if you work that out, it, it's about 23%. And uh, Muslim representation in in, this, in, in, um, in Uttar Pradesh of, of what has become this one down um, tremendously. Uh, would you think that there's a need to actually um, revive um, separate electorate in, in India to uh, Thank you. 
Uh, I'm Ratan. I have a few questions. Uh, I would like uh, both panelists to address my questions. One, did the leaders concern consider a form of federation rather than separation at any stage? That's my question one. Secondly, was Jina a separatist from the beginning or he became a separatist because of the emerging Hindu fundamentalism uh, among some of the Congress leaders? Thirdly, uh, did religion, Hindu, oh, sorry, did caste system among the Hindus play any role in this uh, partition of India? And my last question is, could they have avoided a, a huge bloodshed by postponing the demand for independence by a few years? Thank you. Thank you. Some of these questions were discussed, some of these issues were discussed earlier. Perhaps you were not here at that time. Uh, okay, let's move to that. Let's move to the question there, the gentleman there. My name is Surul Gulyani, I live in Singapore. Uh, Rafiq Zakaria, Congress Minister, in the last time of the book on partition. And he said that uh, Jinnah was always fluctuating between accepting partition or not. Uh, but in, after the partition, then Kairiazam went to Pakistan. The Indian Muslim League visited them and said that we feel cheated. You have settled in a small, small part of the land as Pakistan, and we are still left as a second class community in India. And that situation is developing now. And my small question is are we heading for another partition? Yeah, uh, Sir, just, just wanted to know the uh, response of uh, both panelists to this uh, question. Uh, is there something still to be said about partition as a mode of uh, conflict resolution? Uh, so let me sort of say a little bit more. Uh, so there is this work uh, by this uh, political scientist called Jeffrey Herbs, uh, who talks about Africa and makes this argument that when Africa was going through its sort of decolonization process, they were looking at India and Pakistan and they basically saw the experience of partition and they decided to keep uh, the borders that they, they inherited uh, from the colonial period uh, uh, because they sort of, uh, you know, sort of looked at that experience and they, they wanted to avoid that. Now the problem with that of course was down the road uh, all African elites ended up just controlling their capital cities and lost control of, of the, the hinterlands and then down the road you have these failed states that emerge. Now, India and Pakistan, they sort of tether towards ungovernability sometimes, but you cannot really call them failed states, right? So in this sense, I just wanted to know your opinion on this, because I felt as if uh, uh, you were emphasizing the importance of shared sovereignty, generally uh, partition as a sort of a failed mechanism for conflict resolution. But maybe it avoided bigger conflicts. Now. Let me say that this is a configuration of diehard historians. I'm not sure that they'll respond to political scientists. <laughs> Before that, before we come to the response, maybe the last question here. Um, just a follow up question of what the I'm summing it just a follow up question. Could all this have been avoided had there been reservations just as we have for scheduled tasks and scheduled tribes? If there would have been reservations within the universal adult franchise, for the religious minorities, something which was raised in the Lucknow Pact and also in Jinnah's voting point, could it have been the reservations, yeah. Perfect. Not just not the separate electorate, but within the universal. So for both the panelists, what is their opinion? Okay. okay. I think uh, that's all the time we have, so we have to have to have to go to this one. Yes. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, does partition prevent conflict or add to conflict? Um, I think that um, looking, I'm seeing this as a historian, but looking at many situations, what happens is that um, conflicts which are within a particular region become internationalized as a result of partition. 
and that uh, so you get a different kind of conflict uh, after partition than before, which has some kind of historical linkage with what went before. Uh, so that would seem to indicate to me that um, partition um, as a tool uh, for resolving conflict is, is often um, going to fail. Uh, because it all, all it would do is, is move the problem on to another dimension. Uh, in terms of um, the actual violence in 1947, which we've been skirting around and has come out in a number of the questions, could it, could it have been avoided? Uh, one of the problems in looking at this uh, is uh, the narratives of blame displacement which dominate uh, so it's always a case of if someone had done something, there wouldn't have been the violence. Uh, so blame displacement in terms of Mountbatten's accelerating the transfer of power is one blame displacement. Another blame displacement is obviously if you look at uh, scholarship coming out of Pakistan, it's always um, Congress or the Hindus or the Sikhs predominantly who are blamed for the violence. Uh, and if you look at uh, narratives from India, obviously, the role of the Muslim League National Guards, for example, it is often brought out uh, in terms of the violence. So there's, there's a, a, a blame displacement going on, which the historian has to somehow or other try and read around uh, and say um, what was the reality of the violence. And I think that state collapse creates circumstances in which um, old scores can be paid off, in which uh, violence can be opportunistic. Uh, this is something which I should do I've looked at in terms of uh, the opportunistic as opposed to the politically motivated violence. You've got different levels of violence all coming together, different motives. And I think that uh, this is, is one of the reasons why the violence is, is so um, pervasive, along with the decline of the state uh, and the ability of a state to maintain basic law and order. Well, can I, I'd like to just answer your point, Samir, which is, uh, could it have been avoided? Uh, and I think what, what we don't realize is that in the subcontinent to this day, uh, there are issues of representation uh, for, 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 for scheduled castes, Muslim representation issues. Uh, but India doesn't get partitioned every day. Uh, and I think here I'd like to just emphasize the singular importance of the fact that the British were quitting India. And I don't think that you can underestimate the significance of that in order to understand why the partition occurred in 1947. Many of the same uh, problems that you are uh, alluding to uh, may well occur in India in the years to come, uh, but there is no outside power who is quitting, so it's unlikely to happen. And so what does it boil down to? It boils down to the fact that conflict aside, uh, the only way to uh, deal with it is, is, to, is to sort of negotiate power sharing arrangements. And this art takes me to the question raised about Africa, uh, that the elite chose not to uh, split, but then have ended up losing control of the hinterlands. Uh, they were wise not to split, uh, but very unwise not to uh, actually work with those hinterlands and make them part and parcel of the power, power that was being shared at, 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 at the central level. That's the reason for losing control, and not because they chose not to partition. Partition has become a very bad term since morning. Is it the way to look at it differently, like a divorce among people? The question you have to ask is, what have you done in the last 70 years? So let's not discuss you know, how good it is to the subcontinent India and Pakistan relationship. If you look at it internally, is India done better in the last seven years to treating its own people? And the same question to Pakistan. If you're going to look at everything to the bilateral relations, and the partition is speaking a bad word. But if you look at like the you know, we have a lot of great things, but you know, you reach a point that you recognize we can't coexist for some reasons, people take their own path. So is it possible to look at partition? In as a, as a divorce among individuals, so have you done a better job in the last 70 years? 1965, Singapore, Malaya. 
Let me, can I just sort of make one last point? I think one of the points I made is that partition as a paradigm, as a concept, because it sees things in a particular light, i.e. of differences that are uh, non-negotiable, that people can be separated. The tragedy of the subcontinent is precisely what you're referring to 70 years later. It is not just India-Pakistan partition, but the partitions that occur in our hearts and minds on a daily basis on how we choose to resolve those conflicts in our midst. It is that partition paradigm, that's the evil, that's the idea, that's what is the problem, because it forces you to ferret out people that are united, to create differences where they are now, that could be negotiated. This is what partition has done 70 years after. Okay, on that very somber note, I think it's time for us to close this panel. Please. It's been a wonderful panel, and I think it's a very good start to the workshop. So, with this, please join me in thanking the two speakers. Thank you, Dr. Kubesia and distinguished panelists. We now proceed for a short break. Please be back in the conference room by 11.45 p.m. Thank you.